or wet, Panasonic gives you a shave that's smooth, close, and amazingly easy with the Panasonic Wet-Dry Rechargeable. covering him on there because it didn't look like anybody was picked off or anything. It just didn't look like they had anybody on him. Right, a wall throwing deep. Looking for Chaclain. It's knocked away. And the Argonauts are the champions for 1983. Well, the 31-year-old crowd comes to an end. Bob Obinovich in his second year leading the Toronto Argonauts. That's all I got on a great cup. Somebody hit me right in the head. At Toronto, this, of course, is Bobby Ackles, the happy, happy Bobby Ackles. But I want to say a little piece, good morning, about that Toronto celebration in the streets. That was as phony as a $3 bill. Put up a television camera and get 20 kids to shout and jump, and you're supposed to think the whole city is crazy for joy. It may or may not be. But we'll find out from Bobby Ackles this morning. What happened? <laughs> Never mind, Bobby, don't cry. Promise not to cry? I won't cry, Jack. If you want to cry, will you go to the washroom? Yes, I will. Okay. On the serious side of this morning's program, there's a, an all-party recommendation in the House of Commons which says, scrap, tear up the whole Indian Affairs Department. Give the money to the Indians to spend as they see best. And a number of critics think this is the first step towards setting up a form of apartheid in Canada. Frank Oberly, Tory MP, of course, for Prince George Peace River is here to spell out from his particular view what that report means. And then, in this democracy of British Columbia, I want to point out to you that with the crunch in legal aid, nothing has changed. If a rich man steals a loaf of bread or a poor man steals a loaf of bread, either one of them or both of them will go to jail. The only difference is the rich man has funds for a lawyer and the poor man will be damn lucky if he gets a lawyer at all. And for light relief on a triumphant sporting figure towards the end of the program, we're going to have Dryden. What do you know? Ken Dryden wrote a book. And he didn't use a ghostwriter. Most hockey players can't sign their names. But Dryden has written a good book. But first, Bobby, my heart is broken. How about your pocketbook, Jack? Did you no, bet I don't bet on, <laughs> on surefire losers. And if you want to get at Bobby, get at him now, right after the break. DeWalt unloads to Ray Strong, and on his own, Strong picks up the first down. They set up the middle screen again to John Henry White. Bobby, it's quite traditional in British Columbia. The moment one of our sporting clubs loses the major event to fire the general manager. How do you feel about that this morning? Well, I'm not too concerned about it this morning, Jack. Are you really unhappy? Was it bad <laughs> well, luck or were you... No, no, it's, um, I'm disappointed that we didn't win the game because any time you go into a football game, you, whether it's a preseason game or a championship game, you'd like to win it. But uh, uh, 
Argonauts played well in the second half. Uh, we obviously didn't play well enough to win. If just there had been wind, Pasaglia might have been able to bring off a <laughs> mi miracle with a 70-yard field, field goal. goal yeah. eh? Did it make much of a difference? Would that you, phony atmosphere in there? That, that's not phony atmosphere. Uh, you know, in Edmonton, I hear it was snowing and uh, below zero uh, yesterday afternoon. So that's what we have to look forward to next uh, year for the Grey Cup. Now, they'll have to hold it here again next year, wouldn't they? They'll, they? They should hold it in this stadium every year. Every year. Well, Bobby, what I know about football is nil, so let's go to phones. Go ahead to Bobby Ackles. Good morning, Bobby. Good morning. Dan Sherwood, an old football buddy of yours. Hi, Dan. How are you? Just fine. Congratulations on an excellent year, Bob, and I really feel for you yesterday, but I'm sure you guys will bounce back next year. It's just the luck of the Argo bounce, I guess you might say. Yes, that's right. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Go ahead, please. <coughs> what are you? Go ahead, please. Yeah, just uh, as a longtime BC Lions fan, I'd just like to say thanks a lot for a great season. Sorry we didn't win the big one. So am I. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I think it's the best uh, season I've seen in the CFL ever. It was the best Grey Cup ever. I think so, too. The, <clears throat> two more points, and it would have been great. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yeah. Hello, uh, Jack. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Yes. I don't think it's anybody's fault. You know, we've been entertained all year long you know, by the Lions, and we only lost by one point. Nobody's the fault. We were a good, entertaining game. Nobody's the fault. It's a great game. I think he's in tears. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Go ahead, Thank please. You. Yes, congratulations to the Lions. Uh, I have one complaint in that they brought in an outside team to do the radio play-by-play -play <clears throat> instead of having the local guys do it. Well, that's, that's because it's a Canadian Football League game, sir, and the um, <clears throat> it's, uh, CBC have the contract to do the, uh, the radio and the television. I think, well, I, I can understand that, but I think the local people would have really liked to have the, uh, the local... Oh, I'm sure, and I'd like to have them there, when, especially when we're in the game. Go ahead from Foxville. Yes, good morning. Uh, <coughs> congratulations, Bob, and uh, you boys can hold your heads high. Uh, you had played a hell of a game yesterday. I just wanted to ask you one question, uh, if you think Sam Green would have made any difference or not. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, that's a matter of opinion, but uh, he's not with us anymore, and <laughs> that's one of the breaks. Go ahead from Victoria. Uh, yes. Uh, Bob, that was a, a great game, and... Um, uh, shouldn't be nothing ashamed about. The only thing that worried me, I was sweating the whole game. Uh, sweat was pouring out of my armpits and uh, <laughs> forehead and everything. The only thing that I was uh, worried then is in the end when the, uh, Roy DeWalt, when he has the capability of, uh, of moving around and he, he never did go to his left. The only time he pulled out, a, you know, like the way he is famous for, uh, running around. He never did no running around. The only time he did running around was when he uh, put the pass to uh, uh, John Henry White and have a, was a touchdown. And after that, I didn't see him uh, pull out or go to left or right. or. or okay, or. what do you say, Bobby? <clears throat> well, it's, um, it's a matter of, uh, you know, the game plan was there. Uh, we had to try and move the ball late in the game, and uh, Roy was uh, calling the plays, and... Uh, and doing what he thought he had to to try and score, or at least move within a field goal range late in the game. Go ahead, please. Yes, hi, Bobby Ackles. First of all, I'd like to uh, wish all the BC Lions all the great of luck for next season. But uh, do you think we'll be getting any more help uh, for Roy Dewalt? He's an excellent quarterback, but I believe we, we should have another quarterback to come in there and do the job if, uh, <coughs> when, if Roy doesn't uh, have a good game or so. Well, you know, we have four quarterbacks on our roster, and... Uh, uh, Joe Pow Pow, as you know, has played out his option and uh, not sure what will happen with him. We have two other young quarterbacks, Mike Williams, who we picked up from Edmonton earlier in the year, and I think he's going to be an excellent quarterback, and young Tim Cowan, who was on a reserve list all season, a young quarterback out of Washington, I think will be a, a real good quarterback in the Canadian Football League. Go ahead, please. Hi, Bobby. Hi. Uh, you had an outstanding season this year, and I wish you, know, you guys just played outstanding. Uh, Next year, you guys will get them. And to coin an old phrase, the Lions will roar in 84. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, even though the Lions lost the game, I think action like that is good for the CFL in general. And uh, I know in my case, I plan on buying season tickets for the first time next year. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Now's the time to sell them, isn't it? It sure is. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd just like to know, um, just want to wish the BC Lions good luck for next year. I just want to know if uh, Warren Moon will be in the... 
CFL next year if it'll be good for the league if he's uh, still around. And uh, I heard something about last year with uh, Edmonton that when Toronto was in the game and they scored and they sat on their lead, do you think BC did the same thing? Sat on 17 points from that Toronto common score, 18 points, and then lose the game? Uh, well, that's, that's what happened, but that's not what we were trying to do. I think Toronto played extremely well both offensively and defensively in the second half of the game, especially on defense. They, uh, they just shut us right down. Uh, this is from Eugene, Oregon. Is it? Yeah. Uh, do you think the, uh, the injury to uh, Don Matthews' uh, sons had any effect to, uh, on the, the way Matthews coached the game? No, I don't think that had any effect at all. How are the youngsters this morning? <clears throat> I, late last night, the two uh, youngest boys were still in the hospital, and uh, they were in stable condition, Jack, and I don't think anything serious. Oh, good. Certainly hope not. Go ahead, please. Great game, Bobby. Thank you. But there's one thing. We don't need Crazy George. <laughs> Thank you. Was he a bit in the neck? He was quite quiet yesterday. They um, <clears throat> came close to not allowing him in there, uh, Jack, so uh, he kept it uh, he to so. a dull roar. Go ahead, please. Bob? Yes. Uh, I think Don Matson made the, the proper remark when he said, keep your head high. You can walk the streets and you don't have to look down to anybody. As a matter of fact, I thought it was an excellent season. You and the coaching staff deserve an awful lot of credit. And uh, just in passing, don't listen to Webster. He's getting senile anyway. <laughs> Thank you, sir, but I don't have to look down. I don't get a chance to look down on too many people. <laughs> this is a friend of yours, isn't it? You know that guy, don't no, you? Who is that guy? You put him up to it, didn't you? <laughs> I no, I think he watches you occasionally. I haven't opened my mouth about the game, for goodness sake. You old twit, whoever you are. Don't tangle with me this morning. Or any other morning, for that matter. Go ahead, please. Hi, Bobby. Hello. Good for morning. a great season, for a great year, thanks for bringing us into the Grey Cup. And listen, we can still tell the East we're number one out here, and we're going to do it next year. Thank you. Bye. Well, I think we'll just leave it there, Bobby. It was very good of you to come out this morning. You have uh, exhibited magnificent general managerial skills this year. <laughs> Davidson's given me all your background. By the way, he was complaining about the press coverage again. Is he just stupid? Is he Davidson just, stupid? He just likes to complain. Just, just a mourner and a whiner. That's He's, all he is. <laughs> That's right. You've worked with him. I've worked with him before. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. Thank you, Bobby. Jack. I'll, I'll get back to business this morning, but we had to make a bow in the direction of the magnificent effort. Just. One point, two shots. Two points, two, points, two, two shots. Short. <laughs> My thanks to Bobby Eccles. Down to business after the break. From the Greek. Oh, excuse me, I'll start again. It's dogma in political life in Canada and has been for the last 25 years that the Department of Indian Affairs is a, an administrative and almost a natural disaster. Now, earlier this year, a report of the Special Committee of the House of Commons called Indian Self-Government in Canada brought forth a unanimous all-party agreement on what should be done about Indian self-government in Canada. Uh, and here is uh, Frank Oberly, Tory MP, Prince George Peace River. What does this say in 25 words or less? Does it say, scrap the Indian Affairs Department and flush it down the toilet? That's, the, that's one of the main conclusions, yes. Why? A department of 5,000 bureaucrats, very few of them uh, of native ancestry, very few, I mean, you can count them in two hands, 
and spending $1.2 billion of, dollars of taxpayers' money every year to look after 250,000 status Indians. And how much of that $1.2 billion to look after 250,000 status Indians goes in administration? Well, in, in administration and, and, uh, and delivery of service costs goes half of that $1.2 billion. For 250,000 Indians, yes, yes. $600 million. That's right. Well, that's a scandal. Always has been, Jack, but that's the system. You know, this paternalistic Indian Act, it needs to be scrapped at the same time. Do these people hold the trust funds for Indian bands who are, have titles to their own lands? That's right. Indians, uh, you know, are uh, some kind of a, uh, an underclass, some kind of third or fourth class citizens. They're, they can't own their own property. They can't, you know, they're not mature enough to look after their own money. So the Minister of Indian Affairs, this great trustee in Ottawa, looks after their affairs, and that's why their affairs are what they are, because they're managed by bureaucrats. How much in trust funds for the Indians does this incompetent department, I presume we can call it an incompetent department oh. on the basis of your yeah, study? I, I can say that even on your show, yes. Right, yeah. okay, how much money does this incompetent department hold in Indian trust <coughs> funds? The problem is, Jack, there is no one has ever been able to account for it all. There is no opening balance. The, the argument is that it's $250 million. We say it's close to a billion dollars that, that they hold in trust for Indian people because they haven't paid any interest, you see. There hasn't been any inflation accounting of any of this money. You know, the minister has, under the Indian Act, a, a, a trust responsibility which requires him to manage the assets of Indian people in, in, in their best interest. But there's never been any inflation accounting, you see. He just spend all the money and, and uh, you know, a hundred million dollars that may have been in the trust account 20 years ago is still only worth a hundred million dollars, you see. But they have that money. They know how oh, much they, money they have in trust. Well, not that. No, they don't. Uh, they, they really don't know because the money isn't, of course, in a trust account. It's, it's in the general revenue account of government. All right. Now, what did Coopers and Lybrand, who did a survey for the, your special committee, mm -hmm. how did they describe the competency of the financial handling of the Department of Indian Affairs? Well, they, they used words similar to those of, of, the, of the Auditor General, uh, incompetent and, and out of control. And your recommendation is now what? Well, our recommendation is that we cut the apron strings, Jack, that we, that we permit Indian people in, in, in accordance with the, with, the, with the concept of Aboriginal rights, in accordance with the concept that was uh, entrenched in the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and which is entrenched in, in the laws and the treaties that we make with these people, to give them control over, over their own lives and, and let them plan their own destiny. Cut the apron strings, hold them responsible for their own actions, you know, the children have grown up and these people are entitled, like you are and I am entitled, to manage your own affairs, the affairs of your children, which we're not permitting them to do at this time. Well, just hypothetically speaking, because you've got to try to keep this simple for the public and for me, if there's a half a billion dollars there which can be identified as real money due to the 250,000 status Indians, mm -hmm. Should that money be given to them in accordance with the land they hold or the money held in trust for their band yeah. and say, do the devil what you like with it? That's right. That's, that's what the report says. What, what the report says is that the Indian people would be permitted to establish for themselves uh, some form of self-government. We're not spelling out what that would be, but we are spelling out that before you get an accreditation from, through some kind of a federal charter, you will have to do one thing. You have to be accountable, not to the bureaucrat in Ottawa, but to your own people. To your own band. That's right. So you'll be <clears throat> all kinds of different forms of government. Unfortunately, uh, most of the Indian bands uh, that have appeared before us uh, want to establish some traditional form of government, which will mean that land and monies will be held in common by their, by their own government. Uh, you know, that, that's instinctively abhorrent to me, of course. I, I'd like some democratic form of government. Many Indian bands will establish a, a democratic form of government with, with elected council in democratic elections. Well, but there'll be there, some traditional forms as well. I mean, you're saying that if you give it to a traditional band, that money would not be under proper control. No, it'll be, it'll be under their control, but it'll be, they'll, they'll decide what kind of a trust. They, they might give it to a trust company, they might have it you know, my band in Fort Nelson, for instance, they want their money and they have, they, they, they will set up a charter or, or a constitution that will lay out 
precisely how that money can now, be spent. Now, on the critical side, could this not lead to a shambles? If you broke down, and nobody apparently wants this Department of Indian Affairs, if you broke it right down and you said, okay, uh, Indian groups lined up and get, get the money that's due to yours, mm. could that not, and am I being showing a remnant of the old white colonial snottiness, when I say, could that not turn out to be a total disaster? Because I remember the earlier experiments in the Yukon and elsewhere mm. of giving bands money and saying, spend it. You don't mm. have to account for it. Yeah, but you see, once the money is spent, if that's what they're doing, and that's the, your white prejudice showing through, wherever that has happened, that, that wasn't the case. They did quite well. There are some real success stories throughout the country. Whenever the Indian people took charge of their own affairs and, and, and sold their own resources and told the Department of Indian Affairs to get out of their damn lives, things started to improve, you see. They, they all of a sudden became responsible for their own actions, paid for their own mistakes, and celebrated their own successes. And that's, that's what we were saying. Listen, it wouldn't matter how hard they tried. You know, they couldn't. They couldn't possibly duplicate the shambles that the mess is in now created by the bureaucrats in Ottawa. That, yeah. that's, not, that's not overstating it. They could not duplicate the no. mess that's in no. Ottawa. No. Now, we're not talking about cut-off lands. We're not talking about Indian land claims. We're no. talking about established yeah. treaty Indian lands recognized for this past how many years? Yeah. Well, for the, for the past, well, ever since the treaties years. were made, two, three hundred years. Yeah. Two, three hundred years. Well, particularly since the Royal Proclamation of 1760. Would there not be difficulties, however, when you've got a non-Indian community and an Indian community, mm. whereby the Indian community might choose not to accept any of the regulatory, if we want them, or zoning standards of the nearby non-Indian community. That would cause a lot of problems. You know that. Well, what, what you've got to look at, what, what this report recommends, is that the, the Indian lands and the Indian governments will have control over their lands. Now, there, there won't be municipalities. In some, in some jurisdiction, they will, they will exceed the jurisdictions of the provinces. So the Indian lands will have their own zoning. They, they'll do their own zoning, their own administration, their own land use policies. And they may well not, uh, you know, particularly when it, when it comes to, to respecting certain Aboriginal and cultural, um, you know. But supposing uh, it comes to forestry policies. Well, they, uh, they will manage their own resources. They're, they're well, we've, we've got to be non-prejudicial non enough to say they right. have access to the same advice, they have the same that's right. basic, I suppose, mm -hmm. have they the same basic objectives? They have the same basic objectives, yes. They want their children to live a better life and have a All right, now that future. that's done, now that this report is here, and that yeah. people have been talking about this all the time I've been around here, yeah. this clearly says fire the bureaucrats almost totally, Give the monies you can find that can belong to the Indians back to the Indians. Right. And the land that's there. And let them do as they wish with that land. Yeah. Well, they will have to demonstrate, of course, that, that they can be and are, and they have in place a, a constitution and charter. So you still got to That have a they department. are accountable. No, no, no. no. What, what, the recommend, what the report recommends is the department and the minister be phased out over a period of five years. That there is a, a minister of state of... Indian federal relations, like a Minister of State for Federal Provincial Relations, who will uh, negotiate on behalf of the federal government with these Indian governments for block funding for additional jurisdiction. More on this revolutionary package. It is revolutionary. It isn't is, it? yeah. It, it. After the break. First, I haven't spoken to one. No, I wanted to, to know where to get the report. Uh, from Lillooet. I knew this question would come up very first thing. A non status Indian living off the reserve. Is that your question, George? Hello. Hello. Okay, go ahead to Frank Oberley. Yes, I, I'm not really sure what this new legislation or proposed legislation is, but it, it is coming and it's needed. Uh, really soon the way the government has treated the indians in canada is is terrible they've put with the reserve system and the way the world has changed we've ended up to become what i think is parasites on on the canadian scene 
Was this the kind of uh, stuff you got from the Indian uh, groups and committees that appeared in front of you, Frank? Again and again and again. Indian people want to join us, they want to join us in confederation in our institutions of government, and they want to contribute. They want to be productive in our society, and we've helped them back. We've, we've uh, you know. They would still be subject to all the normal taxation to pay for the share of hospitals, etc. Would well, they? they? They'll be paying. They'll be joining confederation. There'll be uh, some governments will will have to get transfer payments and equalization payments, and 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 others will be producing. Like the BC government <laughs> would want right. money from the Indians <clears throat> once right. they they got control of their Indian trust funds. Is that, that correct? That's right. I can see great problems arising there right now. Can't you? Nothing is simple, Jack. But we've got to make a start. This thing is a blueprint for the future. Because in any case, Indians are covered by all the federal provincial schemes now, are they not? Well, <clears throat> the Indians uh, fall under the sole jurisdiction of the federal government and whatever programs the, the, the province delivers is, is, is gratis. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. Mr. Oberly. Yes, hi. I'm your former constituent. Oh, hi, how are you? I have a, a question uh, to pose to you. Uh, was Mr. Jake Epp the Minister of Indian Affairs at one time? Yes, he was for in the Clark government okay, in 79. This is a fine idea and your proposal is, is excellent. It's long overdue. But why didn't Mr. Epp do something about this when he was in charge? <clears throat> well, the problem was that you can't just go in and do it. Nobody has all the answers. I brought to this committee certain self, you know, preconceived ideas. We, we met in 60 different locations in Canada and talked to 150 uh, different groups of witnesses. And we arrived at a report uh, that is, that is uh, you know, fundamentally different from, from what I would have written or what Jake Epp would, uh, Jake Epp would have written had he, you know, would have, uh, had he written it all by himself. The fact is that we had Indian people on the committee with us, and we, we now have a report that doesn't uh, only have the support of the, of the three political party, but also of the, uh, of the national, uh, recognized national Indian associations. Are you using this issue uh, to uh, gain uh, power in the next federal election? Well, unfortunately, uh, you know, it isn't uh, politically astute to be on the side of Indians in Canada, so nobody will make any political mileage from this thing. And there is an all-party record. I mean, <laughs> Manley of the NDP was on there. Right. Yeah. Who else was on it? Um, Tories from Alberta. Yeah. The chairman was a liberal called Penner. Yeah. Never and heard of him. Warren Allman, the former Minister of Indian Affairs. Good enough. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to know what's going to happen when the B.C. government, uh, I mean, when, after Indian Affairs takes over the B.C. government, uh, like, uh, I know that the B.C. government, you know, doesn't really want anything to do with it. They, they don't like to talk about Indian politics or anything. What's going to happen there? Well, they will just simply have to turn over whatever jurisdiction the B.C. government presently exercises, very little, has to be turned back, uh, that's a recommendation in the report, turned back to the federal government and in turn it'll be turned over to Indian self-government. Provincial jurisdiction which has been kind of encroached in the federal field will go back to Ottawa and then go back to the Indians. That's right. That's a recommendation. That's right. Do the premiers of the provinces have to agree to this or does this, can this be a federal unilateral act? That's, that can be a unilateral act. The federal government has to reassume its jurisdictions because the, the provinces really have no business in it at all. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to say this um, soft government for the Native Indians work. Yep. Yes, I'm a Native <laughs> Indian myself, and I'm non-status, but I wouldn't go resting back to the reserve because I lived in the city all, just about all my life. <laughs> Now, if a non-status Indian off the reserve at the moment wanted to go back to his <coughs> land, would he be free to go back under these <coughs> recommendations? The Indians will themselves decide who, who are Indians and who will be citizens of these, of these government structures. People who, who live in the city and, and, and wish to, uh, to assimilate uh, or integrate in, into, into the city life or the, the white man's institution, uh, they can go on a general list and get certain rights uh, to which they are entitled under treaties and and and. Well, we then have to go through this business of what is an Indian. Well, that's. Uh, is your grandmother uh, an Indian? Are you yeah. an Indian? You know, there, there's absolutely the, the report does not rule out, Jack, for you to go on an Indian reserve, and they'd like to have you as a citizen. No. You can move on there. Yeah, and, if uh, they wanted you on. Yeah, there'd be no blood test or uh, no. That's right. I mean, that's nasty. That. You know, that's got nasty overtones why, to it, hasn't it? Why is that? Well, if you start to say you can come on a reserve if you're a quarter blood or 
half blood. Yeah, but the uh, Indians won't decide it that way. They'll, they'll decide it in terms of tradition and relationship. Look at all the cases we've had up to now about people who lose <coughs> their status because they marry white people. Yeah, the problem is that there are over a million Indian people in this country, and only 250,000 are recognized by the federal government. A million and only 250,000. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Webb, Mr. Overly. Yes, hi. Yes, sir. Uh, are you, are you going to have this final decision on Indian affairs, whether it's <laughs> like turned over to the Indians or not? Do I have the final decision? Yes. No, I. I but there's I, a I simple don't. question. Well, hold on. Will you? <coughs> when the Tory party takes power, because you can you can see it coming out your ears right now, the fact that you're going to take power. Will you rec recommend this be policy soon and implemented soon by uh, the fellow with the long chin, Chief Longchin? Mulroney. I will, uh, I, will rec uh, I will recommend that, no question. Incidentally, Jack, he is in town today. Be polite to no him. No kidding. You haven't got a big enough room in town to host all the tourists tonight, you know. We've got to go into an oh, ante room. Oh, I must go and worship at his feet <laughs> and, you know, touch the hem of the please, garment. Please How long do. has he been there? He's been in the House of Commons a shorter time than I've been. Yes, right. <laughs> anyway, he seems to be quite a nice fellow. What are his policies? <clears throat> Let do you me, know? Let me tell you, Jack, if you... Be nice to know. If you and your friends in the He's NDP and the, the Liberal Party now. want to find out what the policies are called in election... Are you accusing me of being NDP? <laughs> no, I don't know. Hey? I don't know. You're, you're a, treading you're a, on very delicate you're, ground, you're, Frank. You're openly. a closet something. <clears throat> Be nice to Mulroney. That's an even worse accusation. <laughs> and withdraw it forthwith. You're on... <laughs> cool it, Webster. More with Oberly after the break. <laughs> Frank Lo Oberle, Tory MP for Prince George Peach River, who recommends Holus Bolus, the adoption of the All-Party Committee, which says, scrap the Indian Affairs Department. As I said, so flush it down the tube, right? No hesitation at all. 5,000 no. more on the unemployed list. No. They'll, they'll be absorbed somewhere. You know? yeah. Nobody ever gets fired in the federal yeah, government, need, you do need, they? You need more ushers in the new BC Stadium down here. Yeah. As far as you're concerned, Bennett didn't go far enough, did he? That's right. He caved in, I think. Caved in? Yeah. Just another weakling. <laughs> did you just, want to see a general... Just postponed the inevitable, Jack. You wanted to see a general strike, I presume? No, 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 not at all. You wanted to see back-to-work orders, didn't you? Well, that's right. Are you, how far are For you... For some of the people who didn't plow the, stro the, the streets, you know, you, your snow runs away here. You don't have to shovel it. <clears throat> it took me four hours to drive from Chetwin to, to Dawson Creek that crucial day because, the, you know, I, I won't say it. And the Socrates didn't. didn't have enough guts to order a few snow plows back on the road, isn't that That's right? That's right. That's right. Nor to make the... Imperiling public safety. Yeah, and, I'm and, being serious. Yeah. I'm getting your views. That's right. And are you s solidly supported in these views by the people of Prince George? That's right. If Bennett had been tougher, what would have happened in any immediate election? He would have got a bigger mandate than ever. He would have swept the north. Swept the north, yeah. Interesting observation. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Overly. Uh, I just wonder uh, if, if, if the Conservatives do get elected uh, in the next election, are you people really going to do all these things that uh, you are talking about right now? Because over the past, I don't know how many years, probably 100 years, the government has been talking to giving the Indians certain rights and... Uh, their land deals and all kinds of money which uh, you're going to give them. Are you really, really going to do something about it if you do get elected? Uh, I'd really like to hear about that. In other words, you don't trust the Tories? <laughs> no, I don't, because I think it's a lot of talk right now. Everybody can talk before they're elected, but when they're really up to it, can they really perform? The can question. they come across with yeah. all these promises? And this is what the Indians should really look for and, and really press, because I think it's just a lot of promises. Uh, okay, we've yeah. got your message. What's your answer? Well, uh, it's, it's a good question. It's raised everywhere. You know, I, I would like to say, yes, we're going to do all these things. But there has to be a, a, a process of education and a change in public attitudes. You know, the public needs to understand what's in this report, needs to understand the history of, of, of this particular question. But let me tell you about the Tories. You know, it was John Diefenbaker that gave Indian people the right to vote. You know when, Jack? What? In 1961. 
The That's Indian the people. federal <coughs> right to vote. That's right. And they were permitted to, to go to the beer parlor and to the liquor store. It's the, it's the Tories and the conservatives in the United States, the, the Republicans in the United States, that, that brought in the laws, that, that recognized uh, you know, the aboriginal rights of their native Are people. Are you writing your date, 61? That's right. Yeah. You sure? Because mm -hmm. they got the provincial right to vote <coughs> way back about 1949 or 1950. Sure of that? Well, that may be. Never mind. Go ahead from Smithers. Yeah, Mr. Webster? Yeah. Yeah, I've been, uh, been watching your program quite a quite a bit and um, uh, like I'm a native person myself and um, <clears throat> I just like to see that it's it's high time that um, uh, the people have uh, been the uh, government has been uh, talking about doing away with the um, uh, Indian Affairs Indian Affairs uh, like I've um, been doing uh, protests and stuff like that quite a few years ago but I'm, I'm, I'm completely away from that now and uh like, like let's say within the caste system, I mean, we're we're the lowest in the ladder, and uh, it's it's you know like the Department of Indian Affairs have uh, been suppressing us for too long. You know, and it, it's 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 um it's atrocious that uh, the department spends half half the allotted money uh, in, in in administration and stuff like that. And I'd just like to um, ask uh, Mr. Ober Oberly. Uh, how, how much native participation is is going to be involved with with the actual um, uh, implementation, if possible? That's right. what he's asking. Right. Well, <clears throat> if the report is implemented, uh, there will be only native participation. There'll be Indian people will have their own self-government, and and they will be. Uh, relating to one another with uh, in the same way that uh, municipalities and provinces relate and, and the federal government relates to one another. It'll it wouldn't be, be separatism of any time. They'd be under not. the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and all That's the right. rest of it. They'll be, they'll be partners in confederation. Not a separate nation state though. No. Still in the various provinces <coughs> fighting with the provincial leaders as we do. No, they'll, they'll be relating to the federal government not to provincial government. Go ahead please. Yes? That's you sir. Hello, uh, Mr. Overly, I'd like to ask two questions. And the first is, do you honestly believe that the white bureaucrats that have control now, do you honestly believe that they'd be willing to turn that over to the Indian people? And if they ever did, how long do you see foresee the, the Indian people actually having control of their own lives? Well, the, the bureaucrats obviously won't turn it over easily, but look, we'd like a chance to try. I'm not saying if, when we take power, we'd like the chance to, to try and to see whether it's actually possible for politicians to take over control of government again. And, uh, you know, when, with the new government, people uh, expect change and they're, they're more ready to accept it, and yes, we'll take control. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, first, I just wanted to say that I'm very sympathetic towards uh, Native people and their need for uh, self-government. Um, but I'm just wondering, this particular report, how does it differ from the uh, white paper of 1969 proposed by Jean Chrétien, mm. at which time the Indian people themselves uh, felt that, you know, this, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the white paper, but yeah, it... Had to do with uh, okay. what is, dismantling what? of Indian affairs, okay, and yes. Indian self-government. The Native people themselves were the strongest protesters of this. Yeah. Well, there's a very profound difference between the white paper and what we're recommending here. The white paper is a is a municipal type structure that would permit Indian people to uh, regulate dog catching and uh, all these kind of things. We're going, of course, much further. We'd like Indian people to take control of their lives, restore their their culture and, and their pride in, in, in their past and, and, you know, plan their own destiny. Just to finish up, how are things in Prince George these days? How's the economy? Well, uh, Jack, we're, uh, I was down here and I'm, I'm really upset. I attended the Grey Cup game yesterday. It cost $300 to fly from Dawson Creek to Vancouver to, to you know, to watch the Grey. You can fly to Hawaii for that. We come down here and we'll see a you know, build all these uh, edifices at, at our expense. The economy is bad in the north. You know, Fort St. John is... is Do you really object to the B.C. State Place Stadium? Well, uh, Do you object I, to I, the government's expenditure in B.C. Place? Well, it's great when you can come down here and watch it, but very few people can, and Do we're paying object? the bills up there. Do you, you object know? to Northeast Coal Development? 
Well, no, I don't. No, you don't, uh, do you? No, that's right. You're taking a very parochial view of the province, Frank Oberlin. Well, listen, it's about time that Unless you people you down here... No, I'm not joking. You know, it, it offends uh, people that uh, you totally ignore. You know, people in Prince George are sometimes more alienated from this part of the province than, than Vancouver is from, from Toronto and, and, and Ottawa. That's why uh, I, I give you a lot of credit for uh, once a year uh, asking Frank Oberle on your program. Well, if you were any brighter, I'd put you on three or four times a year. <laughs> but trying to get you going is very difficult indeed. <laughs> but I did squeeze out of you this morning, Frank. Okay. By the way, how far to the right of Genghis Khan are you? <laughs> hey, just how far? Jack, if I, if, I could, if I could tell the people where you are, I, I, I you confess... You don't know where I am. I know where you are. You're a good guy. We like you. I've got lots of friends in Prince George. Don't you believe a word of this foul <laughs> propaganda that this man openly says? Yeah. But you do seem to be on the right track. But I'll predict right now, it won't happen in the next five years and Mulroney wouldn't have the guts enough to do it. I predict you're wrong. Now, we, we won't implement the whole report, but we'll start on it, Jack. It's going to be a very tedious, long, and painful process, but we're going to start on it. My thanks to Frank Oberly. Nice to see you. I'm Jack. sorry we couldn't give you a general strike. <laughs> I'll be back with Brian Smith, the Attorney General, after the break. <laughs> Not an appropriate question to ask him, but I'll keep it in my own mind. Have you had anything definite? Okay. Inspector Quitting, once you need to ask you, I said nonsense, I won't ask you. There were so many Liberal cabinet ministers in town on the weekend that international flights couldn't land on the tarmac for 14 hours because of jet stars. Brian Smith is the Attorney General of the province of British Columbia. How many innocent, naive Canadians think out there that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms brought in by Trudeau guarantees you a lawyer and the right to instruct counsel, and ipso facto the right to have counsel supplied to you if you don't have any money? You forget, forget that altogether. That's a whole uh, unresolved question at this particular moment. But we do know that in British Columbia, the Legal Services Society has cut back severely the, the availability of legal aid. And we do know that a superior court in British Columbia has slapped the system and said, when a guy applies for legal aid, in these particular circumstances, he's got to have it. Is that a good summary of the situation at the moment? Mm -hmm. Do you plan to supply, in the lights of this Court of Appeal decision, legal aid for those who presently are denied it, even though their liberty, safety, health, and livelihood are in real jeopardy. They will provide legal aid, the society will, for those people in the interval until we uh, change the legislation, if we're going to do so. In other words, you, you oppose this Court of Appeal decision which says you got to give people legal aid, even if they have previous convictions, or even if they are within these certain limited no. coverages which the Legal Services Society has set down? No, I don't oppose the decision. Um, you think I, they're I, wrong? No, it, they're not, because uh, they're interpreting the, the law as it is now. But uh, we will introduce some changes in the law so that the society can decide on its priorities. All the society did was it said we have limited money for legal aid and we're not going to provide legal aid to everyone charged with a with a summary offense. That means impaired drivers and repeat impaired drivers are not going to have legal aid. We're going to use the money in another way. The Court of Appeal has said that the provincial statute doesn't permit that. So I'm going to amend the, the statute to permit it, but it'll be up to the society to decide how to apply their legal aid priorities. What changes are you going to make? Do I understand you to say that you're going to amend it that they must give legal aid in these cases, say on a repeat impaired conviction? No, the court has said that. Uh, we're going to change the act so that the society can decide and is not fettered with who it has to give legal aid to, that they can decide to give legal aid to impaired drivers or not, but they're not required to by the law. 
What you're telling me, therefore, that by changing the appropriate act, which would be which act? Legal Services Act. Le by changing the Legal Services Act, and I'm not using this offensively, you can make an end run round this Court of Appeal decision. Is that correct? Well, legislation is, no, but is, is, is designed to, uh, to change the law. If a court decision doesn't, doesn't fit so, with spending and social policy, then you amend the law, but you obey the decision in the meantime. Yes, I'm not trying yeah. to trap you. I'm merely saying yes. This decision, which says that Mountain must get legal aid, will be obeyed. Yes. But in future, you will make an end run by tightening up the legal status of the, the Legal Services Society so that they don't have in future, after you've amended the law, to follow this Court of Appeal decision. Correct. Right. That's right. So my phrase end run was correct in its own way, was it not? In its own way. In its own way it was yes. correct. Now, if a person faces jail, loss of liberty, which is the key thing, under your amendments, Will they get legal aid, yes or no? Probably. Yes or no, and no, you give prob me probably. Probably, because um, most people who are charged with first offenses of impaired driving um, don't lose their liberty. But they could. A judge could sentence them to imprisonment. Um, that person, if the society goes back to its old rules, uh, would not get legal aid. You can't carry, uh, cover every contingency of imprisonment, but you'd cover the major ones. In other words, the, uh, if somebody would decide on that man's behalf if he had no money, he would apply to legal aid, say well, you're picked up, X is picked up impaired, uh, and I meet the very stringent qualifications which are very low, are they not? Mm -hmm. What is the monthly qualification of income for legal aid? Well, it dep it's the, it's the uh, national poverty level, and uh, I guess the general test is um, if, he, if he paid for a lawyer, would he be able to meet the necessities of feeding, clothing, and uh, is looking after his family? So somebody would say, okay, Webster, you're charged impaired. We, we do not think, because of your previous clean record, you will go to jail. Therefore, we will not give you a lawyer. Correct? Previous clean record? Yep. No, I'm being serious. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Now, if I had a previous conviction, however, and this was a second offence and the Crown chose to proceed by that method which insists on in jail, you would give me a lawyer? That would be the, the way they would apply it, yes. That's your plan to change the law to? Well, it's not my plan to change the, the law to bring that result about. It's my plan to change the law so the society can be flexible and give legal aid or not give legal aid in those circumstances, but not be stuck with the court decision. I was very anxious to have the Legal Services Society here this morning so that they could present their case to you in front of the public, but they chose not to. They're probably hoping that you will come up with some more money. Are you going to give any more money to legal aid to meet their current deficits in this current year? No, their budget has been, has been set and they have been told that that is their budget. Now, they may incur some additional costs as a result of carrying out this court decision during the fiscal year. If that occurs, I'll certainly recommend that that money be found. But uh, there'll be no new money in this fiscal year otherwise, they know that. You will find the money to carry out the orders of the Court of Appeal in the meantime, but once you've amended the Legal Services Act, you won't have to carry that out anymore. Now, what about domestic disputes? Are they covered by the Tzatol? Family law matters. Well, family law matters, uh, some emergent family law matters would be covered by that decision, and the society would provide legal aid in those cases carrying out that decision. And they have, we must, must give legal aid credit, they have cut uh, their fees paid to private lawyers quite considerably, haven't they? They have brought in a 12.5% reduction in the tariff in September 82, but there was a 38% increase in the fees the previous year, so it's a, it's a reduction of the increase. You're a lawyer. Do you think legal aid has been a racket? No, it has not been a racket. It's been, it's been responsibly and leanly run. I don't think it's been a racket. More with Brian Smith, the Attorney General of the Province of British Columbia, after the break.
I think I've got your position on legal aid right now quite clear. You will not give them any money to meet the deficits. You will supply money to carry out the, in, the wishes of the Court of Appeal in the Mountain case. You will amend the Legal Services Society Act to, so that the legal, the legal aid people have full right to trim the wings as they wish. That's correct, Jack. That's it. Got that clear. Now, what about this other thing? You're a constitutional lawyer. Anybody landing from Mars or coming up from the States would think that in our Constitution Act Part 1, I have the right to retain and instruct counsel without delay and to be informed on that right. The clear assumption there is that if I don't have money, the courts will supply a lawyer on any charge. Is that not the clear, ordinary man's assumption on that? No, I don't think it is. I, I think that uh, you, you don't uh, assume from that that the public purse is going to be plucked for everyone to phone a lawyer. What you assume is that uh, everyone who wishes to hire a lawyer is not going to be prevented from doing so, not going to have delays put in his way, but will be permitted to do so. But I don't read that right as meaning the right to have a lawyer at the public purse. Supplied by the state. That's right. So therefore the old saw is true. If a rich man steals a loaf of bread and a poor man steals a loaf of bread, each may go to jail, except that the rich man shall have a magnificent lawyer and drag on the trial for 19 years and the poor man pleads guilty and goes to jail. Is that not correct? Could be the reverse, but uh, uh, you, have a, you have a right to pay for a lawyer. You don't have a right to have a lawyer paid for you. Why didn't we get that in the Constitution? To retain and instruct counsel without delay and to be informed of the right to pay for a lawyer if they have enough money. But that kind of provision has never been interpreted to mean unlimited uh, free legal aid. As I understand it, may be it argued that criminal it is. matters in the United States, in many states of the Union, lawyers are supplied under the Constitution as a matter of right. And in many states uh, they are not. And in many states, in fact, a, a lot of states have public defender systems uh, who contest with the Crown attorney system and the uh, legal system is very polarized. And our system with the private bar is a much fairer, more balanced system and better than it is in, in American states. Not that you and I are ever philosophical, but the fact remains that, that philosophically speaking, there ain't no justice in the Canadian Constitution as to one's equal appearance before the majesty of the law. Jack, I don't... Depends agree. on your money. No, I don't agree with you. I think that uh, if you appear on a summary matter, undefended, that you do get justice. You don't have someone to speak to you who is paid for by the state in all cases, but you do get justice from the, the court, and the court, the court is very cognizant of your rights. Depends on the judge very much. Well, everything depends on the judge. No, but many a judge gets annoyed, at, some judges get annoyed at legal aid because they say, we represent the counsel, we, do, we, we look after the interests of this man. But the judge hasn't spoken to the accused person, the judge doesn't know all the background. We're surely not going to go to charity law in due course. No, but uh, Jack, the, the opposite premise of that is that the state will provide everyone uh, who cannot afford it with a lawyer in any kind of case for an unlimited number of times, and I don't think the public are prepared to support that. Oh, I remember we used to uh, give uh, drug traffickers from offshore <coughs> unlimited trials and probably still do it, major offenses on legal aid, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah. Maybe that's where you should start cutting back. So well, need to be an old reactionary, a, Frank Oberly. There's a task force on legal aid that is going to be looking at exactly that kind of I'm grateful, situation. though, you've made the situation brutally clear. When will you prepare the amendments to the Legal Services Society Act? Can it be done by regulation or is it no, an amendment? No, no, it'll be amendment to the legislation. It'll have to come into the legislature. At the next sitting of the House? Next sitting of the House. Or the next session of the House? Well, the next session doesn't have to be—it doesn't have to be a new uh, parliament. It can come in in the present session. And the task report will get soon. <clears throat> yes, uh, it's reporting uh, uh, interim report by the end of March. One session of calls with um, Brian Smith, Attorney General of the Province of British Columbia, after break. Here's a guy who got 12 days in jail or a $650 fine. He thinks it's unjust. Can he get a lawyer for an appeal? 
pins Isn't on Isn't that right, caller? Pins on his offense. Uh, that is uh, correct there. Impaired I, driving. It was my first offense, incidentally. Now, would you supply a lawyer for an appeal, hypothetically speaking? If he had uh, reasonable grounds for an appeal, I think the society under the new rules after Mountain would probably provide him with legal aid. But not for the new, not until the, amend, the act has changed. No, they, they do it right now. Well, they'd have to do it right they'd now. They'd have to do it right now, if he had reasonable grounds to appeal. Okay, go to legal aid and tell them Brian Smith, the Attorney General, sent you, and they, can, they will look at it for you. And if they decide you have reasonable grounds for appeal, they might give you help. Is that correct? Yes. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, I'd like to say uh, to your Attorney General that he is uh, talking out of his head because I have uh, gone to legal aid and asked for assistance on a couple of charges. What charges? Uh, one is a shoplifting charge and the other is failure to appear. And they've told you to go jump in the lake? That's right. Is they that... keep telling me that I'm not go going to jail and that I'm not eligible for legal aid. I thought that the judge made that, to, uh, that decision, not the, uh, some lawyer. What happened to your shoplifting charge? Well, I haven't, uh, I have to go back to court, sir. And you've got no liar. I... She, she may be eligible now as a result of, of Mountain. I say maybe. She would not likely face, not... face imprisonment, uh, certainly on a first offense of shoplifting. Uh, failing to appear, uh, probably not as well, but uh, I think with the Mountain decision that she could go back to them, it would be up to them. Is it fair for me to look into camera number so-and-so and say, all those who have recently been refused legal aid may now, because of the Mountain, this judgment of Mr. Justice Lambert, go back to legal aid if their liberty, what's the other phrase, Mr. Smith? Liberty, health. health, or livelihood are in real jeopardy and ask legal aid to reconsider because of the Lambert decision. Correct. Good. Thank you very much. Cam Loops, go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Um, if, we're not tr if we're all treated equal, uh, would we not go to jail on the second drunk driving charge anyway? Isn't that what the law is saying now? Well, I don't know if Mr. Smith wants to get you into the complicated machinations of the ways you can and cannot go to jail, depending on which way the Crown proceeds, correct? If the first uh, offence is proved or acknowledged, then uh, imprisonment is mandatory under the Criminal Code. But thee and me know that within the system, there's a judgment call made somewhere as to whether or not the first offence shall be proven on the second conviction. Sometimes it's a case that you can't prove it as well, but... Uh, because you can't afford to bring a witness from that's Ontario. Right. That's right. So there isn't really equality there. Well, there, no two situations are ever equal, but if you can prove it, uh, everybody equally goes to jail and equally, usually for the same length of time. That's right, but as you and I both know the problem, you can't bring a witness from somewhere else because nobody will put up the money and courts have refused ri written records of these things on occasion. Hey, one more question. Oh, sorry. Are you still there? Hello. One more question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, are, are we going to, uh, for uh, a second offense or a third offense of driving, will you lose your license forever? Is this a proposition that has been raised recently in public discussion by somebody or other, as I recall? Yeah. yeah. Where death is involved in the highway, you lose Long, your license for life? Longer uh, license suspensions, I think, are inevitable for uh, repeat offenders, um, drinking, driving, any involving fatalities, uh, very long suspensions, and maybe maybe losing your license for much of your driving life. That, of course, is a criminal court amendment to be made by Ottawa, if made. Those are under consideration now by the federal minister of justice. By McGuigan, yeah. Yes. McGuigan's one of these liberals, although the town's jammed with them these days. You can't get somebody like McGuigan on a program like this in case he has to answer the question. If he can, I don't know. Go ahead from Penticton. Hello. In Penticton. Yeah. Speak up. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um... Well, you're right on the ball this morning. We'll just skip you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you, ma'am. Ah, uh, yes. Um, will the provincial government recognize the Native Indian civil rights? Um, there, 
I'm uh, a member of the Pacific North Coast Native Co-op. Uh, will the provincial government return the Pacific North Coast Native Co-op back to its members and its board of directors? Because it was an unconditional grant. Since the provincial government put in its management committee to show the Native Indians how to run the plant successfully, the committee has sold off most of its assets at 10 cents on the dollar. The members of the Pacific North Coast Native Co-op have, have been trying to get a meeting with, with you, but to no avail. Uh, will you commit yourself to a meeting with the Pacific North Coast Native Co-op and its members? Excuse me, let me ask a question. Is that the one up at Fort Simpson? Fort Simpson. Fort Simpson. Oh, that's been rollicking around for years. For, for years, yes. Yeah, the, years and yeah. years and years. The lady has uh, uh, oversimplified a very complex problem. I'm prepared to meet with uh, those people designated by the band who represent that co-op uh, and to have a meeting with them. But uh, <coughs> there are two uh, distinct groups within that co-op, and I don't wish to get into co-op politics. I would meet with whoever the... The, the band uh, council designates to meet with me. Uh, excuse me, but the unconditional grant was made to the seven reserves, reserves up the north, so it is not owned by the Port Simpson native uh, band there. It's owned by the seven reserves, and these are the, the members that we're talking about, the Pacific North Coast Native Co-op. Well, well, just one second, ma'am. I don't want to get involved in a, a detailed one on this, but uh, Mr. Smith has indicated a willingness to meet with a group, preferably from the Indian bands. Is that correct? You're not going to get involved in the politics of this co-op? No, and I don't think it's appropriate to air that here. That's not really what we're... Oh, it's we're, always we're, appropriate we're, if it causes trouble, but thank you for your no, call, No, but it's, it's, it doesn't cause me any trouble. I just want to have a meeting with the with a representative proper group. That's all, not with the number of groups. That's fair enough. I think that's a square answer. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Um, my grandson was picked up uh, uh, for shoplifting and possession. He's seven, he was 17, living with his grandparents, who we are. Um, he was charged, at least he was... Um, when was this, ma'am? Just about three weeks ago. What was he charged with? Shoplifting and possession of what? Drugs? Possession, yeah. Possession of drugs? Yes. Now, what? it's his first offense. Is he in adult court? 17. Is he in adult court? He was in adult court. Did he have a lawyer? No. Has he gone to jail yet? No, but he was charged fifty dollars for one for the uh, for the shoplifting of twenty nine dollars worth and fifty dollars for the other. Uh, we're pensioners and we've been supporting him. Hold on, ma'am. I can't get into the details of that, but one of my people will talk to you off the air about it. That yeah, will get involved in the mishmash there, which we can't resolve. Thank you for a fairly lucid explanation this morning. No more money for legal aid. Legal Services Society has to follow the Lambert decision. In the meantime, you will supply additional costs, or you will try to, for additional expenses caused by this decision, and you will change the Legal Services Act so they can have more authority about those whom they wish to refuse legal aid to. Right, and they have a task force who will look at how legal aid should be delivered and funded in the future. That's right. underway now. Very helpful, Brian Smith, indeed. Attorney General of the Province of British Columbia. Did you hear that overly wishing for a general strike? What do you make of these Tory politicians? <laughs> well, I don't think he was wishing for a general strike. Nobody would have wished... You wanted wished... your people to be tougher. We, uh, we were tough, but we were also uh, reasonable and recognized that we could, uh, we could settle the, the labor situation and avoid a general strike, and that was done, and I think most people are grateful that it was done. It was done without surrender. I think both Mr. Bennett and Jack Monroe deserve a lot of credit. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and I hope that doesn't do Monroe any damage at the BC Fed Convention. And I'll be back with a pleasant change of pace. Not that you were unpleasant, sir. Uh, Ken Dryden. The Ken Dryden. In real life. A, law After a lawyer yet, too. <laughs> He's not here as a lawyer. <laughs> After the break. <laughs> Right, yeah. not nicely necessarily. Well, gutless. At least I asked the question. That Frank Overley. Loved his Nazi jacket and his jack boots outside the door. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> oh my God. 
it's not a mystery guest, but it's seldom that you saw him. More, more often than not, you saw him wearing an ugly mask. And behind that mask is the, the very bright, active, philosophical mind of one Ken Dryden. Ken Dryden, of course, started with the Canadians in 71, and you won the Stanley Cup that year as a rookie, as I recall. That's right. Is that not so? Mm -hmm. Now, I was going through your book, and I thought, well, he'll give me all kinds of opinions. Now, I know what questions not to ask you. Shall I try one of them? Sure. What do you think of Harold Ballard? <laughs> <laughs> In 25 words or less. <laughs> I don't want a discourse on it, but I'm only joking. What do you think of Harold Ballard? Not a lot. I mean, I think that he is the, the principal cause for the state of the Toronto Maple Leafs, which is not a very good state. Uh, it appears to be better now than it actually is because the Leafs were as bad as they were a few years ago. They have slightly improved. They're a long ways away. Uh, one part of your book which I enjoyed very much was your somewhat frank discussion about the camaraderie in the club and also some of the little kind of Anglo-French or Anglo-Quebec difficulties. Mm -hmm. You never ran into that, did you? Not very much. I mean, we, uh, uh, the Canadians were a pretty special team that way. I mean, we, there were divisions. Um, I mean, when we would be eating lunch together in a, uh, in a banquet room and we'd have separate tables, uh, you'd sometimes look around and notice that at one table it was all English-speaking players, at another table it would be all French but it would come to us as a surprise because we didn't go into the room to sit down that way. There was nothing conscious about it, but sometimes it would break down that way. Uh, but, but essentially, uh, we were a team that had really no division that way and that uh, we were rarely conscious of it. Where, when we became conscious of it, it's when others would write about it or talk about it, and it was because of their perspectives, that in, that in their line of work, in their experience, they found division and they wrote about it as if we did. But uh, as you could tell by the way the team played on the ice, there was very little. None whatsoever, really. Yeah. Uh, your description or your assessment of Scotty Bowman's kind of interesting. He was not the most communicative man, was he? No, Scotty Bowman never explains. I mean, Scotty Bowman does, and, uh, and the team wins. And at some point, he assumes that everybody will understand. Uh, but when you're involved in a in a very intense kind of activity like hockey, oftentimes you don't understand or you don't wish to understand. And uh, so there were problems occasionally that way, uh, except as you went on, gradually you kind of felt as if somehow, even if you didn't think he was right, uh, he probably was. Yeah, and he had this strange habit, as I recall from your book, which was really very well written. I made a snide crack this morning. It's the first hockey player's book that wasn't done by a ghostwriter or by Scott Young, or one of these uh, writers in the East, I, I noticed that uh, Bowman never, ever used a nickname. That's right. You know, hear that? And that, I mean, he, when you're on a team, everybody has a nickname. I mean, even if, uh, even if it is just the, the diminutive of your, of your own name, uh, somehow you, there's always something. And, um, and everybody goes by nicknames. Everybody writes about these players with their nicknames. And Bowman called everybody, he called, you know, Bo, Bob, Bob Ganey, and, and Guy Lapointe. Uh, it was always Guy and Guy Lafleur, and it was absolutely first name basis. Yeah, always. Kind of formal. Right. Well, it was. I think that, I mean, it was his belief and is his belief in coaching that, uh, that he cannot get close to players. And that is a way of getting close when he feels himself getting close, he runs away. Did I not get the feeling some of the earlier years, and I know, I've no great knowledge of hockey, uh, for a start, I've mostly watched the Vancouver Canucks, <laughs> and that doesn't give one any great knowledge of hockey, does yes. it, Mr. Dryden? No, that's, uh, over the years, you're probably right, yes. <laughs> I don't know how many years, and we've no further, do we have any good, we've got Tiger Williams, who is at least great and colorful, if nothing else, mm -hmm. is that not so? Well, and there are a few. I, I haven't seen the Canucks play very often, but a, a few years ago in junior hockey, I watched Patrick Sundstrom play. Yeah. And he looked very good to me then, and I assume he's a pretty good hockey player now. I always seem to remember from what I'm read about, I've read about you that you had difficulty in kind of deciding how long you were going to carry on. Did you feel that hockey was only really not your lifetime career, but a means to an end? 
I, I don't think it was, a, I didn't look on it as a means to an end, uh, but it isn't a lifetime career. Uh, it can't be a lifetime career. Um, it, it could be if you went on to be a, sco a scout or a coach yeah. or a manager. One of these terrible jobs. Yes. Well, it, it's not a very pleasant job. No. And uh, so I enjoyed playing, and I liked playing as long as I did. Uh, but when you are going to be just a player and you are not going to stay in hockey, then uh, you've got 30 years of work life ahead of you. And uh, there's a point at which you have to stop and, and get on with it. Yeah, I suppose that is. Um, your first hockey was where and when? Oh, in, in Toronto, in a suburb called Islington. And uh, my father built a, uh, a backyard area, playing area. He paved our backyard. And uh, when I was six or seven years old, that's when we started. Do you see much change in hockey today? It's changed. It's, uh, it is a more wide open game, even in the four years that I haven't played. And the, the scores are higher. Uh, it's a more offensive game. Uh, most of those are the right direction. I think that we're in a bit of a transition stage now where we haven't really learned how to play that style with any measure of control yet. And gradually uh, uh, that element will stay in, but the scores will go down and the, and the game will have a little bit more discipline to it. How tall are you? 6'4". What weight? Oh, 210. Is that your hockey weight? Um, that was my hockey weight. In other words, you kept yourself totally fit since those days? No, I'm, uh, I'm rather unfit. Same dimensions, but less fit. Yet I can never ever remember you on television when I've seen you many times and the odd time out here at, at our hockey arena. Never remember seeing you in a brawl. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Oh, that's correct. Uh, I've seen you goalies, attacked a few times. Yeah, goalies don't really, or rarely get involved in that. Oh, yeah, there are a couple mm -hmm. in the league that use their sticks those, brutally yeah. when people come around. That's Did you right. never do that? Uh, not very often. You're the perfectly controlled, gentlemanly hockey player no, of your day. No, no, it's, uh, I mean, you can, you know, the violent feelings are there. You just find a way of trying to cope with them and control them sometimes. Funny, I never thought of you as violent feelings. That, that yeah. really is your mask, therefore, isn't it? The mask helps. Mm -hmm. You put, do your book in a very attractive fashion in that you do your nine days mm -hmm. of what was in your mind. How did you, did you keep actual notes during these particular days or just reconstruct no. them from your memory? No, those are basically reconstructed. They, uh, they're not a real nine days. The, uh, the last day is a, is a real day. And in late February, the last year I played when we played the Islanders. But really, with those nine days, I wanted to put myself into many different situations. And, and by putting myself into those situations, force myself or force a story to come out. Um, um, so that I could go forward and back in time and so on. One last question, one little nag. Were you ever interviewed by a sportscaster who ever asked you a nasty question to your face? Um, not very often. Uh... Aren't they a funny breed? I mean, if I knew of any nasty questions to ask you, I'd ask you. <laughs> but I don't know. Are you signing autographs anywhere? Well, I guess we'll be, we'll be doing uh, uh, something at 12.30 uh, Where? today. I think it's at, uh, at Pacific Center. Pacific Center? Yes. Do you know which store? I want to give you a plug. Uh, I think it's probably Eaton's. Eaton's, 12.30, Pacific Center, today. Okay. Meet the incredible Dryden without mask. Best of luck with your book. Thank you. After the break. Millionaire Indian Chief Ron Derrickson will be here tomorrow as I develop this theme about the incompetence or inefficiency of the Indian Affairs Department. We're going to do a tax auditor on real estate flips. Watch your back. Graham Allen will be with Derrickson. And the shuttle took off again today successfully with the Toronto Argonauts on board, hopefully. We have main engine start. Three, two, one. Solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Columbia and the first flight of the European Space Agency Space Lab. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Roger, roll. Vehicle rolling from tail south around to 35 degree azimuth from northeast. Roger. Scrap the whole Indian Affairs Department. No, I don't like it. Do it again. <laughs>